All right, all right, all right. Good morning, everybody. It is Jay again, and it is around the 1st of December here in Phoenix, Arizona. And I wanted to make a little video for not only the folks that live in hot climates like Phoenix, Arizona, but this video is going to also cover some of you that live in the colder climates and are a little bit out of the zone for growing citrus trees. Now, I've been wanting to do this video for a while because there are a couple Facebook groups that are dedicated to just growing citrus trees in containers. And I thought I would cover a lot of the information that will help those of you also, not just those of us that live in the hot climates. So that's what we're gonna be talking about a little bit today. We're gonna to be talking about citrus trees grown in containers. And I'm hoping this helps out a good portion of the country because we love our citrus out here in Arizona and we're one of the biggest states that sell and carry citrus trees. And the variety, the varieties that we have out here in the valley is, is just stunning. We've got many, 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 many varieties of citrus. And so I wanted to go over a couple of those also, but I'm gonna be giving you guys some tips on how to get this much fruit off of a tree, especially if it's in a container. Now also, just to let you guys know that these aren't exactly small fruits. So you can see by the one in my hand here, these are normal size fruits, if not even a little bit larger than what you would have in the ground. And the trees are a lot more prolific while they're in a container, while they're small. Now, once they get a little bit larger, of course, you're going to need to either put them in the ground or put them in a larger container, or they're going to stop growing. So that is tip number one is <clears throat> room constraints. So a citrus tree or any other tree for that matter is going to grow into the size that it's allowed to grow into. It's gonna grow into the space that's available. So you see, I've got these citrus trees in containers and I've got them relatively close to each other. So they're gonna grow in more of a compact form. Now, as you can see, this is a, this is a mandarin. So this is an Awari Satsuma and this is probably one of the best, one of the best citrus that's available and definitely one of the better better mandarins that are available. And you can see that this is not a very big tree. So if I grab the trunk here, the trunk here is about an inch around. And I'm gonna go up to kind of show you the size of this tree. He's not very big guys. This is actually a smaller tree. In the pot, it's about my height. So it's right about six foot. Got a very, very skinny trunk. And you can see that every single branch on this little tree is bowing over from the weight of the fruit. I mean, look at these beautiful fruit. Absolutely perfect. And man, a lot. I mean, I don't think that this little tree could support any more fruit. Look at all these, look at this big cluster right here. Wow. That is absolutely beautiful. Nice one here and a big old nice cluster back here also. So you can see that you can get fruit off of an extremely small tree. And if you think that it's just that I've got one around here that's just full of fruit, every single one of the trees that I have around here that are available are going to be like that. You might not be able to tell at first. So like this is a, this is a clementine and it doesn't look like it has very much fruit on it. But if we come down and we pull the branches up, you'll notice that all the fruit is hiding underneath all of those leaves and you can't even see it. So of course the, the birds can't see it either. Let me see if I could pull this, pull this group out here. Look at these. The tree is just absolutely full. Every single branch, that I pull up is loaded with fruit. I'm hoping you guys can see this. Let me see if I can pull some of these around. So it looks like, especially on a clementine, that there is no fruit on the tree at all whatsoever. 
but if you start pulling all these branches out of the way you'll start exposing the fruit and you'll see that this thing has hundreds of fruit on it also they're just all hiding so this is kind of a neat tree and the fact that you can't see any fruit on it at all whatsoever and still until it starts producing so let's go over some more of these tips because I don't want this video to be too long for you guys, but I want to show you a couple examples right here and we'll walk around and, and look at another couple examples because every single tree is like that. Every single tree is loaded, completely loaded full of fruit. Right? The more you dig, the more you find back here. And man, I'll tell you, Mandarins and blood oranges, I really have an affinity towards. Here's some kumquats here. But look at the sheer amount of fruit that you can get off of these little, little container trees. So now, now that we've gone over a couple of these, like I said, let's get back into the tips. So that first one was room constraints. They're only gonna grow into an area that you allow them to. So however big you want them to get, that's the area that, that you put them in. If you put citrus real close to each other, like I sort of have them out here in pots, then they're going to keep a certain size, but the size and shape of them will be nice for when you plant them in your yard. Okay, so the second tip I'm gonna give you guys today is going to be that the pot size matters. Size matters, guys. And it really, really does as far as getting good quality and size and fruit out of your trees. So let's look at the smallest tree or the smallest pot size that a citrus tree should probably ever be in. So citrus grow pretty fast and they've got a pretty good size root system. So when you constrain these into too small of a pot, they're never really going to grow. So I see a lot of these in containers that are a lot smaller than this one. So this is a 15 gallon and a 15 gallon is appropriate for starting a young citrus. If you've got anything smaller than that, a 10 gallon or a five gallon, then the roots do not have the room to grow so that once you put them into the ground, they never really seem to make it. Now, if you're gonna keep up potting them into larger pots, then of course you can start with a five gallon. But if you want any, any type of production, you want to start with a 15 gallon at the minimum. And you can kind of see that this gets, this will get around a one inch trunk inside of a 15 gallon pot. And then eventually it's gonna to start to slow down and not grow very much more. So out of a 15 gallon pot, you're going to get about four to six feet of growth on a plant like that due to the size of the pot. Now, if you'll notice the pots that we have these larger citrus in, these are gonna be in a 25 gallon pot. So the 25 gallon pot allows room for the roots to grow and it also allows room for it to start to set on all this extra fruit. So in a smaller pot, like the 15 gallon I just showed you, you're probably not gonna get a lot of uh, fruit production on a tree in a pot that small. Now you will get some pretty good growth on it, but when it comes down to the fruiting and the fruiting size, then you're gonna wanna use a larger pot. So that is definitely, definitely one of the most important things that you could do with citrus is keep them in a larger container. Okay, so tip number three is going to be water. And I can tell you for a fact that nobody in Arizona, in particular, waters enough. Now, in other states, these pots aren't going to dry out quite as quickly. So you don't have to water them every day or every other day like you would have to in Phoenix, Arizona. It's nice having these larger pot sizes because these larger pot sizes will hold water and moisture for a lot longer. So if you go out of town or you have an emergency, then you don't have to worry about the tree drying out. If, if it's in a smaller container, like you can see the 15 gallon right next to the 25, well, this is gonna dry out twice as quickly as the 25 gallon. And if you've got one in a five gallon, like the mulberry is sitting right there, then it's gonna dry out four times as quickly as the 25 gallon is. So having a larger pot is also going to reserve a lot of the water. 
citrus trees are very, very thirsty. And it's, it's sort of commonly known here in Arizona that you want to water them and then let the roots dry out. Well, that's one thing that I don't do at all whatsoever. So <clears throat> I don't follow that advice as far as letting them dry out. In fact, I, I never let them dry out. These are kept at a somewhat moist, moist content pretty much the entire time that I have them. So you can see that the, that the soil down in there is actually quite moist. Now, during the winter months, you're going to be cutting these back quite a bit to maybe once a week or once every 10 days. But in the spring and in the summer, when they are actively fruiting and growing and blooming, you might want to give your citrus just a little bit extra bump in water. And it really depends on your drainage also. If your drainage is very poor, then yes, it is very possible to overwater a citrus tree, but most people here have pretty good draining soil and they flood their citrus trees and then they, they dry them out for a week or so between, which like I said before, I don't do that, but I also get a really wild amount of production on the trees that are especially in the ground. I mean, I don't know if you guys can see up here, but there's <laughs> there's five mandarins in a little row right there. And mandarins are a little bit trickier than, than other citrus trees here in Arizona. So to get this amount of production on mandarins and blood oranges and kumquats is pretty pretty unique because those trees usually suffer a little bit a little bit more from the sun. So water guys, water, 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 especially if you're living in a hot climate, you're definitely going to want to give these guys a little bit more water to keep them nice and green and beautiful. So if you look at the leaves on these, these citrus trees are absolutely perfect. There's no nutrient deficiency at all whatsoever. There's no salt burn on the tips. There's no edge burning. And in fact, these plants are very, very, very dark green if done right here in Arizona. Now, if you'll notice most, Ariz most Arizona citrus, other than a lot of the stuff that you see here is gonna be a slightly yellowish color. Um, it's gonna be bleached out from the sun and a lot of that is from either poor nutrition or not enough water. It is very possible to keep these plants extremely dark green, the leaves looking absolutely perfect on them. And this has a lot to do with the food also, but it has probably more to do with the water. So if you want to have extremely productive fruit trees look at this variegated pink lemon isn't this beautiful and if you want to have things like this where you've got these white leaves that are basically out here in the full sun and you don't want them to burn well then it's a matter of keeping water to the actual plant so they need a fair amount of water in the spring and summer not so much in the fall and winter but make sure you guys get water to these plants Okay, so the fourth tip I'm gonna go over is going to be food. So a lot of people get the water concept of citrus but they or fruit trees, but they don't get the feeding part. So a plant does the exact same things that you do. So it drinks water, it eats food, it goes to sleep, it goes dormant or rests during the winter, uh, it breathes air, so a lot of these a lot of these plants are doing the same things you're doing. So a lot of people remember the water part, but they always forget about the food part. And food is very, very important to citrus trees if you want them to keep producing. If you're going to take all the fruit off of them every year, rob them of, of that fruit, which is basically their future, their future food for themselves, then you need to put that back in some form of feeding. So Man, look at that group. <laughs> Sorry guys, I just get get sort of enamored by all these different citrus that, that we can grow here. So compost is what I use to feed these, feed these trees. If they're in a container, well, I've got sort of a self-feeding system here because the earthworms are actually in the container and they poop out the bottom during the night. So a lot of this that you see on the outside of the pots here, this is earthworm castings. So the way that I feed the pots here is sort of self-feeding in the fact that I can take the worm castings, scrape them off the ground, 
put them back into the pot and that will now feed the tree again. So these, the way I have this system is sort of self-sustaining, self-feeding. Now, what if you've got one, what if you've got a citrus tree in the ground? <clears throat> well, you're also going to need to feed it. So a lot of people are either going to choose a fertilizer, which is going to be sort of a non-organic way of feeding them, or they're going to choose a compost, which is what I like to choose to feed these trees. And so I put a little bit of compost back in the pots and I put a lot of compost in the yard and that is going to self-generate and feed these trees because like I said if you're taking all the fruit off of them every year then the tree is not going to have any food to eat also if you clean up all the leaf litter or any leaves that happen to drop well that is also the food for the tree for the next year so it does help to keep them a little bit a little bit fed with some organic material no matter which way that you choose um, you'll also notice that on a lot of the trees around here <clears throat> that you're going to see the root flare of the tree. You're going to see the trunk of the tree, then you're going to see the flare, and then you're going to see probably at least the first root. So the reason that I've got these a little bit higher is so that they don't get any, any what's called trunk rot. So let's go over to this one and we're gonna see the same thing happening here. We're gonna see a little bit of that root flare and I'm gonna to wanna to see at least that first root of that citrus tree. What happens to citrus commonly is they'll get root rot or they'll get crown rot <clears throat> around the base of that tree. And that's because that tree has been planted too deep. So when you see at least that first root, well, then you know for a fact that you've got that planted at the correct level and you don't have that planted too deep. If you've got the soil up way high up on this trunk, then it's going to stay wet and eventually it's going to rot through that trunk and it's going to kill that tree. So by keeping it a little bit higher there, um, you won't rot or lose the tree. Okay, so let's go over the... The fifth tip here is going to be varieties. So different varieties grow better in pots than others. And it's generally going to be something that produces a little bit of a smaller, a smaller fruit. So when you've got things like kumquats, which I was just over there, let's see. If you've got things like kumquats and you've got mandarins, which are a little bit smaller, right mandarins and blood oranges oh wow look at those those are beautiful too blood oranges um, they're going to be a little bit smaller fruits so they're going to do a little bit better in pots than larger fruits are i can show you some examples here of some larger fruits okay so this is an example of a of a larger fruit and i'm not talking about the the tree itself although that does have a little bit to do with it because obviously the larger the fruit that you have the larger the tree has to be to support support that plant so here's an example this is a pomelo and this one has gotten some pretty good size so this one's about seven going towards eight feet tall but he's just not as happy in this pot as say like the smaller fruit like I showed you, like maybe an orange, right? Now this does have um, enormous fruit. So pomelos, let me see if I can pull this, pull this thing even up for you to see it. Pomelos are huge. So they're absolutely a giant fruit. And you can see that this tree is straining with just that one fruit on it. So you can imagine if this thing was covered with these larger fruits, it wouldn't do as well. So this is probably a better choice uh, tree for in the ground and not necessarily the best for a container. Look at the size of those. Those things are enormous. Now, panning over to the side here, um, I've got another one here and I've got this one in a slightly larger box. This is in a 24 inch box. And so this one has a little bit more room and you can see that this one has grown a little bit bigger. So this one's right there at the, at the roof line of my house. And this one also has enormous fruit on it too. Let me see if I can pull these up. Man, that's a 
that's a big fruit and these aren't even really done yet these are still going to grow some more but man that is a more than a handful of fruit i just i can't believe these things can hold these hold these giant fruits on them so here's another pomelo now you'll notice on this pomelo yes it's in a 24 inch box it's got a pretty good size and spread to the canopy here and then you'll also notice and here's sort of the here's the dead giveaway on whether or not you're doing well on your plants so pomelos have huge leaves so they've got I don't know if you guys can see that but that's a pretty that's a pretty good sized citrus leaf and they're big and they're glossy green dark glossy green and these tend to burn a little bit more in the sun so this is one that i've got in a little bit of a shadier area because you just can't take the sun quite oh man look at that leaf i mean look at that leaf that is absolutely perfect growing here in phoenix arizona that is an enormous leaf and to give you sort of a sort of a size comparison we'll look right over here at this at this grapefruit so this is a rio red grapefruit and like i said they just need a little bit more room for a bigger bigger fruit so this is in a 24 inch box also and if we get up underneath the canopy here we will see that he is also loaded with some really nice fruits for such a small little tree. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven giant grapefruit <laughs> pulling this little tree down. Here, I'll get back so you guys can see the size of it. So you can see that a very small tree, he's not that big, very small tree will can be extremely productive if you give it the correct the correct stuff so if you'll follow this list on the one through ten you will also get beautiful citrus that looks like this that is absolutely full of fruit so going back to varieties the smaller varieties are going to do better in smaller pots the larger varieties like the pomelos grapefruits lemons some lemons right behind me here <clears throat> man that thing's got probably more lemons than leaves <laughs> now at this point but variety is very 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 important and just know that in a pot that's the 25 gallon you can get that tree pretty good size so this there's the trunk on this tree uh, you can see the roots and the root flare and you can see that this has become quite a quite a large lemon now so size does matter like i said and this is about the max size you're going to get out of a 24 inch box or a 25 gallon pot which is about the about the size that i deal with because that is a very productive very productive size we get back here to some of these other ones you can start to see the the fruit is ripening up on them but loaded, just completely loaded every tree around here. Has so much fruit on it, I don't know what I'll ever do with it. And then here's an example of an Oral Blanco. He's kind of mixed with a, mixed with a mulberry there, but you can see that this one's gotten quite large. This one's, I don't know, at least at the 10 foot range and oro blancos are also a large very large grapefruit and you can see that even this little tree has got some pretty good sized fruit on it so size matters guys it really really does the larger containers are going to get you the larger trees the smaller containers will get you the smaller trees all right so let's go over the where are we at sixth sixth tip of the day which is going to be cold protection cold protection so i'm going to use this little little gold nugget mandarin as an example um mandarins blood oranges almost all citrus are going to ripen up 
after the cold. They need a little bit of that cold in order to get the fruit nice and sweet. And if you're wanting blood oranges to be red, then you definitely have to wait till after the cold. And you'll probably be eating those around February. February, March is when you're going to eat, be eating most citrus. Now, some citrus is coming on now, like the Owari Satsuma. And what's cool about that is that shows you a little bit of that window of the plants produce over a long period of time. So you're not going to get all your citrus at once. Like I just showed you on the Satsuma back there, the the Awari Satsuma, that one's ripening first. So that's the one that, that's the Mandarin in the Mandarin family that we're going to eat first will be those Satsumas. Then the next, the next to come on would be the Tango Mandarins, which I'll show you in a minute. The next one would be the Gold Nugget Mandarins and the Clementines. So you see, you get a long harvest of production even in one family of trees, like, like the Mandarins. Now you can kind of tell that those are one of my favorites because they are absolutely delicious. They are sweet, easy to peel, and just, they get loaded all over the tree. And kids really, really love these little oranges. They're, they're called cuties at the store, different varieties. And they really, really, kids really enjoy these. So as far as cold production goes, if you live in an area where it freezes, where it gets below 32, then this is something that your guys are going to want to bring in or put them close to the house. If you've got a garage you can put them in, that'd be fine. If you can put them in the house, even better. I know a lot of people don't want to have trees in their house over the winter time, uh, but a lot of us that are dedicated to getting the, the fruit, then we're gonna absolutely put them inside over the winter. Now, what is good or bad about putting them inside over the winter? Well, that is typically when most citrus ripen and they need a lot of sunlight during those time periods so what ends up happening is a lot of people put these inside and they do not put enough light on them <clears throat> citrus need full sun they even need full sun here in arizona in a place where you would think that that would be too much sun for them and it would cook them but that is not true so citrus need basically all the light that you can give them so if you're going to move these inside over the winter time that is very critical for you to get a grow light and put a grow light on these so that they remain given that light over the winter time because that's a very important time period for them another thing that's going to happen because you're not giving them enough light is you're going to probably start to get some pests on the plant so one of the major pests you're going to get on the plant from not having enough light is going to be spider mites so if you have a spider mite infestation on your citrus trees especially the ones that are inside or if they're outside look to see if it's not in a shady spot so look to see if the spider mites are on an area of the tree where it's shaded most of the day or spider mites will be on your plants on the inside because they're not getting enough light to give them the immunity to keep the spider mites off of them naturally so what it comes down to on the, I see this question a lot is, you know, how do I get rid of spider mites? Well, you get rid of them by not getting them in the first place. And that's by giving the plant enough light. So if you're going to bring it in the garage, or if you're going to bring it in the house, then you need to put a supplemental grow light on it. Not just put it near a somewhat sunny window, guys. That's not going to cut it. That might be okay for a house plant or overwintering a mango tree, okay? But it's not going to cut it on citrus. They need a lot, a lot, a lot of light. And in fact, some of these I'm going to have to move because they're getting, they're getting too shaded out because winter drops the sun in the sky. So it's not going to have as much sunlight on these trees. So I'm going to have to do a little bit of rearranging here to make sure I get all the citrus trees in the sun for the winter so they can warm up during the day and they can actually ripen the fruit for me so that is actually tip number six would be cold protection tip number seven would be light giving them enough sunlight or enough supplemental light if you're going to move them to the inside okay and we're back to the back again and we're going to talk about tip number eight which is going to be wind wind is very very damaging to citrus plants and I can tell you for a fact here in Phoenix Arizona that as soon as they start to bloom in the spring I can guarantee you we're gonna have a windy week every single year since I've been doing this 
every time it starts to bloom, you'll get these beautiful citrus blooms, and then we'll have a week of 100 mile an hour winds. And what that does is it dries and blows off the blossoms so you end up with no fruit, basically. A tree can heavily, heavily bloom. You get a windstorm that's drying it off because you're probably not watering it at the same time. So it's slowly desiccating the plant. And the first thing that it's going to get rid of is the blossoms and the fruit because it needs to support itself and try to keep itself alive, right? So wind is very, very critical to think about and it can even kill some plants like a starfruit tree. So if you're growing those also, just know that that is something that is extremely damaging to plants and fruit and you're going to get that almost every season. Now, what can you do about it? Uh, you can't do nothing about it really. It's just a little tip for you to realize that, hey, you know, during that windy season, if I start to lose a little bit of my blooms, just make sure I get out there and water a little bit more and also expect that to happen because that's gonna happen here in the valley, especially where it is, it gets pretty windy in the fall and in the spring here in Arizona. So that is something to be aware of. Now also know that they do not need another pollinator to pollinate them. Almost all citrus are self-fertile and you do not need two of them. Now, you do need two of them because you're gonna enjoy citrus so much that you're gonna probably end up with 50 varieties of these things, especially if you live here in the valley. I've got probably 50 different varieties of citrus planted here in the ground, not just in the pots, because I like to have a tree in the ground of every single tree that I grow and sell so that you can see for a fact that not only does it grow here, but it fruits really heavily here. And you can also start to see the size and the shape of the trees with that as an example. So like this is a, this is a gold nugget Mandarin and he has gotten pretty large and pretty tall. I use this back here as a, as a privacy wall tree. There's a metal wall right behind it there. So you can see that that also does not affect the tree and as far as its growth goes. So I've got a nice, beautiful uh, gold nugget mandarin here in the ground. And like I said, I've got examples of every single tree that I grow and sell in the ground because I don't want this to be any kind of smoke and mirrors. And I want you guys to be able to actually achieve the same fruit that I get here on your trees. So all the trees that I do currently sell, I have one at least in the ground that's big and mature so that you guys can see the fruit or maybe even try the fruit. You know, when these start to ripen up, I like to give them to clients and customers that are over here. And then that talks them into a mandarin tree and I don't even have to do any talking. I just have to give them, give them some of the fruit and once they try it, they're sold and they want something that's, that's highly productive for them also. So, um, the wind, blossoms, pollination. You don't have to worry about them being pollinated. In fact, when a lot of these get pollinated, they're going to have a lot more seeds in them from the bees. And some of the citrus are what's basically called genetically, they're genetically sterile. They're not going to have seeds no matter what happens basically. So that a good example, that would be like this gold nugget mandarin and the tango mandarin, which we'll look at here in just a minute. And those are almost always seedless no matter what happens. So whether they get pollinated or not, um, they always seem to set a, a really heavy fruit set that is not, that is not seedy. Okay, now we are over by the tango mandarin, which is one that I wanted to show you guys also. And what a beautiful little fruit these are. Aren't those cute? <laughs> And man, this is also a very, very highly productive tree. And like I said, what's nice about the mandarins is they hide all their fruit. So all their fruit are going to be on these, on these lower branches. And you really have to kind of look for it until they ripen up. And then they'll start showing really, really nice color. And then you can actually start to find the fruit. But this is a tango mandarin, which also happens to be a premier, premier mandarin. And this is a little bit of a smaller tree. So like you can see that this can be kept in a container a little bit easier. Now this one's in the ground because I want to show you guys. 
um, one of these in the ground. And man, it's just neat how you got to really look for the fruit because they look like they have nothing on them. And then you start to look around and you start to see all the all the fruit that's actually on this on this little tree. It's just they're hiding. They're just hiding different places. Okay, so and this one is probably not getting enough sun now that we're into winter, but I'm going to be pruning and I've got deciduous trees some behind me and so some of those will lose their leaves and allow that sunlight to pass back over here to this little mandarin tree okay so let's go over pests so there are basically four main pests that you're going to encounter on your citrus trees the first one is going to be spider mites and spider mites are going to look like a web from a spider so it's going to cover a lot of the leaves and it usually covers they usually get on a lot of the in interior leaves so you won't see them as much on the outside leaves as you will the interior it's going to look like a spider web and really the best way to get rid of them is to spray them with water wash them off with water and then get the plant in more sunlight if you'll do those two things then you will get rid of the spider mites okay uh the second pest we're going to go over real quick on citrus trees is going to be a leaf miner so what a leaf miner does and i've got a pretty good example right right here what a leaf miner does is if you can see the trails that run through that leaf right so it's a moth it's a caterpillar it's a moth that lays an egg the caterpillar hatches out gets inside the leaf actually inside the leaf to where you can't get to it and what it'll do is it'll mine the leaf. It'll leave a little trail. You'll see this trail that runs all throughout the, um, the leaf, basically. And they curl up the leaves and they start to kind of look nasty like this. And eventually those will fall off. But what you can do is you can just cut these off if these bother you. Um, leaf miners in Arizona are considered normal and they're considered cosmetic. So basically, they're going to attack the new leaves. So you can see that they've gotten this these new leaf sets here. Meanwhile, the old leaves are not attacked. Now, this, may, this probably won't happen on the next flush. So what you do is you trim these off, it'll flush again, and more than likely it won't be minor season, citrus minor season during that time period, and you will get the growth and the leaves that you want. This happens every once in a while, and I thought I would definitely go over it so that you know what to look for or you know what to expect and you know that that is basically it's just cosmetic here in arizona this is called a citrus leaf miner and very 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 common okay so another pest that we have to kind of deal with on citrus a very another very common one here especially in arizona is a bug that is called a thrip and so a thrip what it likes to do is it likes to eat the very beginning of the as the new leaf is producing. So as the leaf is producing, they're going to start to suck the sap out of it. And what that does is it deforms the leaf and it makes it all curly and small and not that great looking. And I can tell you almost a dead giveaway. There's another another good set there. I can tell you almost a dead giveaway would be mandarins because mandarins are the most affected plant by thrips or one that you're going to see the most often is going to be on mandarins now this does happen on other fruit trees i can show you an example of one on a grapefruit but it's basically going to be this curly small sort of deformed leaves and it's going to be usually on the new growth now this is also considered cosmetic in arizona we don't like to put pesticides on these things, which obviously you could do and you wouldn't have any of these problems at all, but it is considered um, cosmetic here basically. And a lot of it's gonna be on that top vegetative growth anyway, that you're going to be cutting off during the winter. So you get a lot of this extra growth that shoots up over the summer and the fall, and you're gonna be trimming that off in the winter any, anyway. So more than likely you're gonna be cutting off a lot of that thrip damage but it's just something to get used to and it can kind of happen any time of the year on really kind of any plant. Uh, what do we got next to us here? A lemon. So there's a lemon and you can see that these leaves are nice. Then it's got a little bit of that thrip damage and then it goes right back into 
new growth again, which has no damage at all whatsoever. So it ends up kind of look, making your tree kind of look like a, like a mosaic, I guess. And just know that that's basically cosmetic. You're going to be cutting that off. You can see it real good right there. You're going to be cutting it off every winter anyway. So it really, really doesn't matter or affect the fruit production on the trees, as you can see. So those are some common ones there. And then the, the fourth one, which I'm going to go over, which I don't have or a good example of that, but it would be the swallowtail butterfly larva. So it's going to be, <clears throat> it's going to be a caterpillar and it's going to be on your new growth of your trees. So as soon as your trees start to put on new growth, this swallowtail butterfly is going to lay its eggs on the new growth then the caterpillar is going to eat your new growth right now you may think oh you know i love nature and i want to give the butterfly some food so i you know i'll sacrifice my tree to do that now if you've got a larger tree that's fine but if you have a smaller tree that swallowtail butterfly larva is going to eat all of your new growth and on a smaller tree, I have seen them kill them, basically, because every time the tree tries to grow again, it puts on a new little growth, and then it gets eaten by the caterpillar. And then it tries to grow again, and it gets eaten by the caterpillar. And what ends up happening is you either stunt the growth of the tree, and you end up with a really small dwarf tree. Or if it's a really small tree, which I don't have any around here to show you, but if I did, it would kill it. It could actually kill that tree by eating too much of the new growth of that plant and it never gets a chance to do anything. So I try to pick them off if I can and I try to put them on a bigger plant. So if I see them on a smaller citrus tree eating, well, I don't like to kill them because I like the butterfly version of it. So what I'll do is I'll just pick them off and I'll put them on an older tree, an older citrus tree, and they can eat all they want, become a butterfly, and then everybody's happy. But if that happens too soon, and actually, I don't know if these are the eggs or not, but they look exactly like this. So if these aren't the butterfly eggs, see those right there? If, if these aren't those, I don't know if these are exactly, but they look identical to this. So see those little, those little eggs there? That's what these, the uh, cocoons will, will basically hatch out of. So if you start to see that, then you can just kind of flick the little eggs off if you want to or let them hatch and do their their life cycle okay so number nine would be would be pests and then i'm going to do a final one here i'm sorry i've kind of stretched this video a lot longer than you guys expected but this one's going to be for getting the correct soil so a lot of the issues that i see of people bringing plants indoors whether it be a citrus plant or a ficus tree or any any plant you just name it is they end up getting, um, they get fungus gnats. So they get soil gnats that are in the actual, actual soil here. And if you're getting soil gnats, then there is a problem with your soil mix. You're, you're, you need a better soil mix and it might be an issue of it also staying a little bit too moist on the top surface for too long. So a lot of those fungus gnats are gonna live in about the top inch of soil and when you bring plants inside, then they start to kind of hatch out and kind of do their, do their own thing. But a lot of that has to do with the correct soil. So you need a really good potting mix if you're going to keep trees in containers and especially take them inside. Now, this mix that I make, I make a mix for potted trees, obviously, because I'm a nursery and I make my own soil for all these trees. And this is a mixture of 28 different ingredients that are in this. And a lot of these have to do with regulating the amount of water and drainage that are in the plants. I don't want the soil to stay too wet. I don't want it to stay too dry. I want it to stay perfect. And the drainage is the most important thing. So when these fill up or when these sprayers come on, I want to see that water coming out the bottom of that plant and I don't want the plant to be too heavy after it's watered. So if you have a tree like this and you can't pick that thing up after you've watered it, well then chances are you've got too heavy of a soil mix. Um, if you have too light of a soil mix, it's probably going to be a little bit better than too heavy. Um, you want to use 
some regulatory means of operation in here. So like I use a lot of perlite in my soil. I use a lot of cocoa coir. I use uh, volcanic rock to kind of regulate the water. Uh, peat moss. There's, like I said, there's 28 different ingredients in my potting mix that I make to keep the plants healthy and to keep the pests off of them and to keep them solid through the winter. So a tree, like I told you guys earlier, is very much like a human and they can get sick and get pests and diseases just like we do basically. So if, in order to keep them healthy and to keep their immune system up, you wanna give them a good soil mix. And I grow, I grow these in, this is basically, let's call it 90% compost and 10% regulatory items. And what this does is this uh, self feeds the tree almost its entire life, especially in the pot, so I don't have to feed them. And it also regulates the water so that they're not too, not too wet. The top surface always dries back. That's very, very critical, especially if you're wanting to get rid of like the, the fungus gnats because that's where they wanna be. So a lot of it is the soil mixes, right? So that's a lot of the problems that I see, guys. I'm hoping this video helped a lot. Um, like I said, this is not just for the people that are here in the valley because a lot of us grow citrus in containers here anyway, and it's not, not that hard for us. But I see a lot of people from all over the country that would love to grow citrus, and they would love to have the amount of production that we have around here. But they just don't quite know what to do because... They don't have this plant native there. So the grass is always greener, guys. Like we, I want, you know, you got people in Illinois that want to grow citrus. You know, they want to grow citrus like we do. But then there's people here in Arizona like me that want to grow persimmons and pawpaws, which they can grow easily in Illinois with no problems. Whereas we struggle with them here. So I think it's just a matter of the grass is greener <laughs> on the other side, no matter which way you look at it guys right but i wanted you guys to see this little video while i've got a lot of the citrus on the actual trees and definitely if people come by the nursery they can try the different citrus and see if there's something that they like i i'm not an expert in citrus but i've got it pretty pretty down i've got citrus pretty down and i've also got a lot of different varieties that i carry because I don't like just the same old boring things. I like things with, with a really, really, really good variety. So, all right, guys, that is going to be it. I'm sorry about it being a little bit longer than it should be, but this video is to help out, like I said, other people in the country because I know, oh my God, I know you guys want to get the same production that I'm having here but you're living in a climate where it might be a little bit colder. It might be out of your zone. All right, guys, that is it. Thank you for watching. Super long video. Please like and subscribe. I do put a little bit of thought and work into these videos, even though it doesn't seem like it because I don't post that often. But a lot of it is me making sure I've got all the, the right information for you guys uh, before I do the actual video so I can cover a, a wider gamut of people that are wanting to grow fruit trees, not just those of us that are here in the valley. All right, guys, that is it. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe.